everyone to another Control Meets Learning virtual seminar. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Marco Pavone from Stanford University. Uh, Marco is an Associate Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics at Stanford University, where he is the Director of the Autonomous Systems Laboratory, ASL, and Co-Director of the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford, CARS. Uh, Marco received his PhD um, from MIT in 2010, and then he spent some time at NASA JPL um, as a research technologist within the robotics section. Uh, Marco has made uh, fundamental contributions to control theory, robotics, um, and I think his uh, main interests are in um, autonomous and in, in design and analysis of um, autonomous systems and controlling them with particular emphasis on self-driving cars, um, autonomous aerospace vehicles, and also future mobility systems. Um, Marco has received numerous awards, and it's hard to list them all. Um, he has received the prestigious uh, PKs award from President Barack Obama, um, and Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award, NASA Career Award, um, NASA, um, uh, sorry, NSF Career Award, NASA Early Career Faculty Award, and um, Early Career Spotlight Award from the Robotics uh, Science and Systems Foundation. Marco was also identified by the American Society for Engineering Education as one of the America's 20 most highly promising investigators under the age of 40. Um, he's also serving as, uh, as an associate editor for the IEEE Control Systems Magazine. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have Marco and um, without further ado, let's welcome him. Uh, so Marco, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Navid, for the kind invitation and the kind uh, introduction. My lab broadly focuses uh, on the design of planning and decision-making algorithms for autonomous robots by leveraging and blending uh, techniques from optimal control and uh, machine learning. One key application domain in my work is uh, space robotics. And indeed, as also Navid mentioned, as uh, before joining Stanford, I was uh, a research technologist at another Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, as a research technologist at JPL, I worked on optimizing the entry, descent, and landing of uh, rovers on the Mars surface. I've also been working on uh, uh, the design of robotic mobility platforms for exploration of uh, very low gravity bodies, such as asteroids and comets, where traditionally mobility systems based on wheels do not work very well. And the complex topography of the environment makes mobility extremely challenging. For example, on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see the very rugged surface of a comet. And in particular, in collaboration with JPL, uh, I have designed internally actuated hopping robots, which we tested in a microgravity test that de developed in my lab that you can see here on the right. Moreover, through the collaboration with NASA Ames and that Mark Kutkowski group uh, here at Stanford, we're currently working on uh, planning and control techniques to grasp and manipulate objects uh, in space. Here, I'm showing some uh, tests carried out at uh, NASA Ames, where the zero gravity environment of space is uh, emulated by using uh, uh, air bearings of a very flat uh, granite uh, table. The arms are uh, equipped with uh, um, jet inspired grippers. That is uh, grippers that uh, future, that are equipped with uh, pads that by exploit exploiting a directionally aligned micro features become adhesives when loaded in shear stats. A flight qualifies version of this gripper, along with its control algorithm, has been sent to the International Space Station in 2010 and will be tested, uh, tested next month. So this is quite uh, exciting. The key point is that in all these applications, increasing the level of autonomy represents a major challenge. Due in particular to the uncertainty of the environment, coupled with the co complex and often stochastic dynamics of the robots. And in this context, a very promising direction to tackle such a challenge 
is intended to carefully blend the techniques from machine learning at optimal control in order to harness the generality of the former and also the sound uh, mathematical guarantees of the latter. And this is a key trust, uh, research trust in my lab. On a different note, safely and efficiently managing a human robot interactions represents another prime example of a setting that necessitates the principal blending of uh, machine learning and optimal control techniques. In fact, modeling human behavior is arguably uh, better addressed via data-driven models. And in turn, given the safety critical nature of uh, human robot uh, interaction settings, it is usually very helpful to uh, control the robots by infusing uh, uh, techniques from uh, optimal control that boast uh, typically safety guarantees. And indeed, the goal of this talk is to discuss my work, my work on blending machine learning and optimal control in the setting of uh, human robot interactions by using autonomous driving as an example. Driving indeed entails uh, very complex uh, interactions. For example, here you're seeing a, a case whereby the overall goal of everyone is uh, clear. There are some vehicles that are trying to, they're trying to merge into, onto a highway. Other vi vehicles are trying to go straight. But the outcome of the interaction is uh, highly uncertain and often uh, relies on uh, a complex and sometimes even aggressive uh, negotiation. In other words, and uh, this is a quote that uh, I really like from uh, a Google report, uh, interactions are really an exercise in uh, negotiations. And uh, an autonomous robot should be capable of performing such negotiations in order to enable safe and efficient driving or more broadly safe and efficient interactions with uh, humans. In other words, uh, autonomous robots should be able to perform what I refer to as interaction-aware decision-making, which entails a proactive interact with other agents to infer their intents, while concurrently exploiting this information to take actions that account for agent responses. So what I'm going to discuss today is how we can best merge techniques from machine learning and optimal control to enable interaction-aware decision-making. Let me start with uh, some uh, high-level uh, considerations. The key approach to enable interaction over decision-making is model-based, whereby a probabilistic understanding of the interaction dynamics is used as the basis for policy construction. This is different from model-free approaches, whereby human action possibilities and relative likelihood are only implicitly encoded in a policy that is learned from data. And the rationale is that by decoupling intent prediction from a policy construction, we can achieve a level of transparency that is typically unavailable with model-free approaches. Now, within a model-based approach, the first step is to come up with a model that allows us to predict human intent, or more specifically, to forecast its trajectories. And here is where really machine learning shines. Specifically, I would argue that there are five key considerations that we should take into account when designing models for behavioral prediction. The first one is that from the point of view of decision-making, we are interested in intent prediction models that allow us to predict human intent in response to or condition on uh, candidate robot actions. So for a given robot action, possible robot action, we want to understand what could be the possible uh, human uh, responses. Second, we are targeting uh, uh, decision-making settings with uh, uh, action-reaction responses on the order of about one second. This is different from uh, traditional high-level decision-making where one reasons in terms of uh, multi-second decisions. And it's also different from uh, reactive uh, control, for example, for uh, collision avoidance that typically happens at the millisecond level. Third, at this level of the decision-making hierarchy, uh, uncertainty is typically multimodal, corresponding to drastic, drastically different features for the uh, human agents. For example, on the right-hand side, I'm showing the case of a traffic weaving scenario where a human-operated vehicle depicted in blue is trying to exchange lane with a robot-operated vehicle in white. And so the uh, robot vehicle 
uh, may ask the following question. If I were to accelerate as depicted by a long white arrow, what could be the possible responses by the human? And here in this example, you see that the human might have two responses. It might accelerate according to the blue arrows or actually might decelerate according to the yellow arrows. This is what I refer to as a multimodal uncertainty characterization for interim prediction. Fourth, we want to have a model that allow us to take into account uh, history dependencies in order to uncover latent behavior such as aggressiveness or alertness. And finally, we would like to have a model that is as interpretable as possible to ease the um, debugging process and to increase the confidence we have in this model. Now, um, to infer human intent, typical approaches such as inverse enforcement learning, which I refer to as ontological or theory of mind, postulate some structure on the human decision-making process. For example, in the form of a cost uh, um, function that we postulate a human is trying to optimize. But this postulated structure is sometimes difficult to reconcile with how humans make their own decisions. For example, human drivers certainly aren't adversarial, nor they are cooperative. And this fuzziness of behavior is typically difficult to reconcile with the theory of mind approach that is ultimately rooted in game theory. So complementarily with this approach, we have investigated whether given enough data, we can reason about the relative likelihoods of human actions and uh, responses without making any structural assumptions on how humans make their own uh, reasoning. So basically we want to um, uh, capture and uh, characterize the probabilistic structure of an interaction without making any structural assumptions on it. Specifically, and I refer to these approaches as a phenomenological because we are not really placing any structural assumptions on the model. Specifically, there has been a lot of interest from the um, um, machine learning community on uh, generative models. That is models that basically allow us to predict uh, uh, the future in full generality. Where our work differs, differs from the norm is that since we are interested in interactive behavior, we not only want to make predictions based on past observations, but we also want to reason about how someone might respond contingent to a future robot action. Specifically, specifically, we want to learn a probability distribution P that allow us to predict the future human action, U of H, H stands for human, T plus one is the next time step, conditional on the history of uh, the interaction in terms of uh, relative uh, states, for example, relative positions, relative speeds, depicted by X, and relative controls, depicted by U, and crucially, also conditional on a future candidate robot action. U, R of T plus one, R, the R subscript stands for robot. So this really encodes the notion that we want also to reason how a human might respond contingent to a candidate robot action, U, R, T plus one. Conditioning on history, let us infer uh, latent behavior such as aggressiveness or alertness. And conditioning on the future, that is on the future on a candidate robot action, allows us to capture the interactive aspect of an interaction. In practice, in order to learn such a probability distribution P, we use a conditional variational, variational autoencoder model. And this is how it works. So here on this plot, I'm showing a prediction in the setting of a pairwise interaction. So we have a robot vehicle and a human operated vehicle. On the x-axis, we have a time. On the y-axis, we have longitudinal acceleration. A solid line means depicts longitudinal acceleration that have happened in the past. Blue refers to the longitudinal acceleration for the robot. And red uh, refers to the longitudinal acceleration for the human-operated vehicle. So that's how we use this model. We ask the following question. Is if the robot were to enact an action sequence whereby it first accelerates, then uh, it goes at uh, constant speed and then decelerates as depicted by the dashed line, what could be the possible responses by the human? That's the sampling from the generative model, the CVA model. And here we see that we have a bunch of uh, possible predicted responses 
most of them would predict that the human operated vehicle would decelerate. So we have a negative uh, longitudinal accelerations, but in few cases we predict it might accelerate. And then we use this as the basis for uh, decision making. Now we have extended this framework um, to ingest as conditioning variables uh, a vast set of heterogeneous data from dynamical information. Clearly, a pedestrian um, moves uh, from a dynamical standpoint in a way that is very much different from a car, all the way to maps encoding information such as road boundaries and crosswalks, all the way to human silhouettes. The end result is a Trajectron++, a generative trajectory forecasting model that explicitly reasons about agent dynamics, eating state-of-the-art performance. Specifically, we tested the Trajectron++ against a number of deterministic and generative baselines with respect to a number of evaluation metrics. And Trajectron++ achieved, uh, uh, actually significantly outperforms, outperformed the state-of-the-art. All the uh, results are provided in a paper we recently published in ECCB in 2020. Importantly, accounting for dynamics and maps for predictions makes uh, a big difference. What I mean by accounting for dynamics is, then, is that the probability distribution P that I showed before also depends on uh, um, a map information, for example, encoded through uh, CNN and through dynamic information about uh, um, the different agents on the road. Specifically, at the top, there is uh, our base model only taking into account the previous agent trajectory information. The dashed um, uh, white lines with uh, some black dots are the ground truth. And let's focus on the red vehicle on the top left. Here you see that uh, the vehicle actually undershoots the turn and makes uh, overconfident predictions. The overconfident predictions are represented by the ellipses uh, that you see around the predicted trajectory. So as you, see, as you see, there is a bit of a divergence between the ground truth, again, the line in uh, white, and the predicted trajectories uh, predicted by the red blobs. At the bottom, uh, our base model is augmented by a dynamics integration scheme and a map encoder. In this case, you see that the model is able to correct the prediction to almost like exactly on the ground truth, leveraging the additional information that the high definition maps can provide. All our code, data, and so on is available on our GitHub page. So the key takeaway message here is that uh, um, phenomenological models, and in particular deep generative models, achieve state of the art uh, performance. When we started this research about uh, two, three years ago, this uh, uh, was still um, uh, a bit controversial, results seem to confirm this uh, uh, claim. Now, so far we have talked about uh, um, how to uh, perform trajectory forecasting. But at the end of the day, we are at least uh, from my point of view, interested in a decision making. So how do we use uh, such a trajectory forecasting model for decision making? Well, we use um, the, um, this model in the following way. What we do is, uh, for, in the case of a car, we look at a bunch of uh, motion primitives for the car. So basically candidate action sequences, combination of accelerate, decelerate, uh, change lane, and so on. And for each one of them, we sample a bunch of uh, human responses by sampling the CVE model. In actuality, we sample about 100,000 responses per uh, computation per uh, decision making cycle. By leveraging GPU, we can do this in uh, with a frequency of about three, four hertz. So it's actually real time uh, compatible. What we do then is to score the best action sequence according to uh, an aggregate uh, uh, metric. We drive the first chunk of it and then we replan in a receding horizon fashion. In our base approach, we look at the average performance. So we look at, for each action sequence, at uh, um, uh, the average uh, performance according to some aggregate cost function we have a, where you have a bunch of penalty terms here depicted by J, the JIs. For example, the fact that uh, you don't want to collide with other vehicles, you want to perform your uh, task, for example, exchanging lane as uh, quick as possible, and so on and so forth. 
But the point here is that actually we have distribution information. So you might wonder, why don't you also take into account uh, what might happen in the tail? For example, uh, rare cases whereby you might collide with a vehicle. This will lead us to the uh, fascinating topic of a risk sensitive decision making, whereby you swap the expectation operator with a risk measure row. Uh, for example, you could use coherent risk measures such as conditional variance at risk or other type of risk assessments. This is a very fascinating topic and also quite complex topic. It is uh, quite difficult to come up with a risk measure that is really interpretable and uh, numerically tractable. Uh, and I won't go into the details in this talk, but I defer you to a paper that I published uh, uh, two, three years ago with a former postdoc of mine, Ali Majumar, now in a faculty at Princeton, which is basically a position paper about how we view uh, uh, risk assessment in the context of robotics. But for, for the rest of this talk, we're going to focus on uh, average that is expected uh, performance according to the expected operator. Mm. Now, how does all of these work uh, at recent simulations? Uh, to test all this framework in the simulations of both trajectory forecasting and the decision making, uh, we consider again a traffic weaving scenario where there is a human operated vehicle and a robotic vehicle that try to exchange, uh, to swap lane before the uh, road forks. And we perform uh, human in the loop simulations by using the virus VTD simulator. So basically the human operated vehicle is operated by um, a student of mine, a human, while the robot, uh, robotic vehicle is actually controlled by the algorithms that I have discussed. So uh, as I said, the task is to swap lane before the road forks. On the left hand side, uh, uh, I'm going to show predicted human responses in terms of longitudinal velocity and longitudinal acceleration for a candidate uh, uh, future robot trajectory. And here you can see that actually some, uh, the interaction looks quite uh, uh, natural. The white vehicle again is the robotic vehicle. And you see that there are some interesting behaviors that uh, emerge. For example, in this case, the white vehicle nudges a little bit on the other lane to probe the reaction of the human and that the human in this case is uh, kind enough to decelerate and so the human uh, swaps lane in front of the, uh, so, uh, the robotic vehicle uh, uh, cuts in front of the uh, human operated vehicle. So this is all good and nice until a uh, disaster happens. So for example, this is a case whereby the human, the blue vehicle operates in a way that defies the um, robotic, uh, uh, the, the robot expectations of what basically the CBA, CBA model was uh, predicting and there is a collision. Now, probabilistic, something that I want to point out and is uh, quite crucial for the purposes of this talk is that uh, probabilistic predictions are still uh, guesses. And sometimes our conditional variational autoencoder model guesses it wrong. Rarely, but sometimes it happens that a human behaves in a way that defies the prediction of the conditional variational autoencoder model. More in general, probabilistic planning typically rooted in uh, uh, data-driven techniques, uh, even with fairly sophisticated interaction models can lead to unsafe behaviors for three main reasons. The first one is that, as I said, probabilistic models may get it wrong. As us humans, of course, we make a lot of predictions about our environment, about the environment around us, and sometimes we uh, guess it wrong. Second, typically at this level of the decision-making hierarchy, we incorporate collision avoidance as an additional penalty term in aggregate cost function. And this might cause some uh, conflicting objectives, which again might lead to unsafe behavior. And finally, uh, replanning at three, four hertz is ultimately too slow to ensure safety. So this leads us to a key question. That is, how do we best integrate the safety assurances within a probabilistic performance-centric planning framework? Or in other words, how do we really bring to the table controlled theoretical methods fostering safety assurances within a probabilistic planning framework that typically uh, leverage data-driven techniques? 
More explicitly, the big dilemma is how to strike the right balance between safety and efficiency. Specifically, high-level planners typically leverage a probabilistic reasoning to promote efficiency at the cost of safety. In contrast, low-level planners typically leverage worst-case reasoning to promote safety at the cost of efficiency. Of course, we would like to be at the yellow star. That is, that we want to be maximally safe and maximally efficient. But in reality, uh, what you can achieve, arguably, is to find a good trade-off between the safety of a stay, uh, well, of low-level planners and uh, the proficiency of high-level planners. So, notion sure you would like to be somewhere in the green blob with a question mark. So, how do we do that? Well, here the key challenge is is how to glue the safety a safety controller, typically based on optimal control methods, with the higher level probabilistic planner, typically based on machine learning techniques such as our project on plus plus model, in a way that does not unduly impact performance. And in fact, I would argue that in the academic literature, such an interaction among different layers of the uh, autonomy stack is often uh, overlooked. So let's design, let's talk first about the design of the safety controller, and then we'll see how the different layers of the decision-making stack can be glued in, a, in an effective way. Specifically, there are several approaches to promote safety. Uh, like for example, uh, by using potential fields, uh, constraint optimization, library of emergen uh, emergency maneuvers, and so on and so forth. These techniques, however, do not account for uh, uh, interactions with a sentient uh, agent. Thus, they're difficult to glue with the decision-making uh, uh, plan, with a decision-making module that strives to uh, promote efficiency through smooth negotiations. In our work, to account for interactions also at the control level, we harness the tools of hamilton jacobi uh, reachability. Now, reachability is often interpreted in, in a forward, open loop uh, uh, sense, where human, where human dynamics are propagated forward in time, and the resulting set, the forward reachable set, is treated as an obstacle. This unfortunately leads to a very uh, conservative characterization of what a human might do and typically it's not very useful for planning purposes. Basically, it would cause the robotic vehicle to be uh, uh, I mean, stopped or going slowly every time. In our work, instead, we focus on a backward uh, reachability, where the joint dynamics are propagated backward in time, accounting for the closed loop interaction between the human operated vehicle and the robotic vehicle. The resulting set basically encodes the notion that you do, not want, you do not want to put yourself in a situation where you cannot recover from. And I will claim that this is how I typically ride my motorbike. Uh, I ride my motorbike, I drive my motorbike in a way that is very much different from the way that I drive my car, since a collision when, when you are on a motorbike is much more dangerous. And typically, I like to think that the way I drive my motorbike is exactly what uh, backward reachability is telling us. You do want to be boxed in. You don't want to be in a situation where if someone else has to act radically, you have no way to get out of trouble. Explicitly, a backward reachable set, so this notion of uh, uh, situations where you don't want to be boxed in, is defined as a set of avoid states for which there exist strategies for the human that for all inputs of the robot will lead to a collision. These sets can be computed by solving the hamilton jacobi isaac partial differential equations, whose solution, B, referred to as the value function, give the backward reachable set as uh, it's a zero sublevel set. Computing uh, the backward reachable set is hard, but fortunately, it can be done offline. The optimal avoidance, um, uh, robot avoidance and control, is then the control UR that offers the greatest increase in the value function B, assuming worst case reactions from the human. Here, the control of the human, as usual in our notation, is uh, uh, UR. Uh, sorry, is UH. H is a subscript for the human, R is a subscript for the robot. 
Now, previous applications of uh, uh, hamilton jacobi isaac solution in the context of a collision avoidance entailed switching to the control U star R whenever near the backward reachable set. This, however, can give rise to very aggressive maneuvers. For example, here at the bottom, I'm showing the case where now the green box is the human operated vehicle, the red box is the robotic vehicle. You see that the green, the human is whirling into the robotic vehicle, and the robotic vehicle does the same thing that is, uh, it, uh, uh, it stops, but probably not very efficient. If every time that uh, a human is whirling into us, we were to exit the road and stop, certainly we will be safe, but not very efficient. And we wouldn't use such a, an auto automated vehicle for mobility purposes. So how we can somehow mitigate such, uh, uh, such a conservatism uh, inherent in uh, the notion of uh, hamilton jacobi solutions controls? Well, the key idea is that rather than switching to the optimal avoidance controller, we optimize in terms of safety preserving controls. Specifically, the set of safety preserving controls represent a set of control actions for the robot, UR, that ensure that the value function is uh, non decreasing. That is, is in the UR, in, in the set uh, capital UR, we have controls that not, not necessarily leads us to the greatest increase of the value function, but this ensure that uh, the value function is not decreasing. Now, this set in general leads to complex non-convex um, optimization problems. So in our work, in order to enable uh, real-time computation time, real-time com computation times in the order of uh, 100 hertz, we consider a linearized version of the set. Then the low-level controller uh, entails solving model predictive control optimization problem, which is quite standard in that we penalize tracking error with respect to a desired trajectory computed in our context by a probabilistic planner that uses data-driven techniques subject to um, dynamical, well, linearized dynamical constraints, stable hand in envelope constraints, control constraints, and so on. So all of this is standard but with a crucial addition of an instantaneous interaction safety constraint whenever near the backward reachable set that enforces safety uh, through the lens of a hamilton jacobi reachability. That is, whenever we are close to the backward reachable set, we uh, only reason about the controls that are safety preserving. That is, they, they have the property that the value function is non-decreasing. The overall problem is a quadratic problem that uh, we solve at about 100 hertz by using the operator splitting method for the solution to quadratic problems. So putting everything together, the full uh, decision-making control stack uh, looks as follows. On the left-hand side, we have a high-level machine learning-based interaction planner producing nominal trajectories through a generative model of a human intent, for example, a CVAE model. On the right-hand side, we have a reachability cache based on optimal control techniques that encodes the notion of uh, relative states that are unsafe. That is, that might lead to collision despite our best effort. And then we have a low level safe tracking controller uh, uh, in the middle that uh, executes control that minimally deviate from the planner's choice if the vehicle approach the set of unsafe states. So this is basically how we bring together uh, learning and control, at least in the setting of uh, in uh, uh, interaction aware decision making. And here, the, the crucial aspect is that we reason about uh, uh, interactions at all levels of the uh, decision making hierarchy, probabilistically in the case of interaction planner, worst case in the case of uh, reachability computation, and then we blend the two through the MPC controller that I just proposed. Now, even though this framework has been presented only in the case of a pairwise uh, interactions, actually we generalize this framework also to the case of uh, um, interactions with uh, multiple agents. How does this work? Well, we tested the full decision-making control stack on an experimental vehicle that uh, we have at CARS, uh, the Center for Automotive Research at Stanford. So the vehicle, is a full drive-by-wire vehicle that you see here. 
and we have implemented the, the full stack. So the perception algorithms, uh, the intent prediction algorithms, the decision-making algorithms, reachability computation, low level, the low level PC controller and so on. The task again, and this is like a motivating example throughout the talk, is to, uh, um, is a task of traffic weaving. So the robotic vehicle has to exchange lane with a human operating vehicle, uh, human operated vehicle. Here, for safety reason for the pets, uh, we, uh, the human operated vehicle is emulated by an RC car. The very small vehicle that you see with a white mast. So this vehicle is operated remotely by um, a student. And then we ask uh, the students to abuse of the algorithms. That is to operate nominally for a few seconds and then do something crazy, basically swerve into the vehicle to see how the robotic vehicle behaves. So here you see in this example that at the beginning, as we will see in a second, the human operated vehicle, so the RC car is operating correctly, it's going straight, but then all of a sudden swerves into the um, robotic vehicle and the robotic vehicle recovers from this uh, unexpected maneuver in a fairly natural way. So it minimally deviates from its desired trajectory by going just a tiny bit uh, uh, outside of the road, but without stopping and always maintaining, uh, at least in this case, uh, safety uh, at all times. An interesting aspect here is that uh, since distributed computation are hard, uh, we try to come up with models that are as minimalistic as possible. For example, for the uh, autonomous car, we consider a single track six dimensional model. For the uh, human vehicle, the RC car, we consider dynamically standard uh, uh, Dubin's model. And so the, um, but in order to save, to make the model as small as possible, we did not account initially for the um, dynamics of the front tire. So basically how long it takes to go from full left to full right. Actually that gave an advantage to the human operated, uh, to the robotic vehicle that the robotic vehicle did not have, which led to collisions and experiments. So we went back to our computation by adding a new state to model the um, steering of the front vehicles. And then we saw that actually our algorithms were behaving as uh, expected. So the, the point here is that actually uh, especially when you deal with the uh, data-driven models and a complicated system, testing on the road, on the physical system re is really important and also teaches you a lot of lessons. Anyway, let's get back to our notional plot of safety versus efficiency trade-off and see how we are doing. So on the left-hand side, we have the notional plot. On the right-hand side, we have a real data from our experiments. On... Um, the yellow dots corresponds to a controller that uh, only enforces safety through uh, the um, uh, Hamilton-Jacobi uh, reachability computation, but we do not reason probabilistically. The red dots correspond to the setting whereby we uh, only reason probabilistic, probabilistically, that is we do not add the uh, HJI uh, constraints. And that in the former case, so in the case where we are adversarial, as you would expect, we are typically very safe, but sometimes not very efficient. That is, we might stop. In the, the case where we tend to reason only probabilistically, we have typically high efficiency in terms, for example, of how quickly we perform the maneuver, but sometimes we might have collision. The green dots are basically the um, results from uh, the experiments where we consider the MPC control framework that merges uh, probabilistic predictions with uh, the hamilton jacobi reachability constraint. And here you see that actually we reach a very nice trade-off between uh, the two competing methods. Now, related to the idea of uh, infusing safety assurances with these, within those components of the autonomy stack that they rely on uh, data-driven techniques, I have recently kick, kicked off a very large center sponsored by NASA on safe AI for aviation autonomy. where we're focusing on uh, three main research trusts online assurances through robust and more structured learning, uh, so, sorry, offline assurances through more robust and structured learning, online assurances through runtime monitors and recovery methods, in part inspired by the work that I have presented, and airspace control techniques for the setting where some of the aircraft are autonomous. So the bottom line of uh, uh, the second part of the talk is that the safe and efficient interaction where decision-making requires a principal blending of a probabilistic and adversarial planning. In our context, 
through the lens of an MPC controller that blends the two main modules. Now, I'd like to conclude the talk by giving you uh, an uh, overview of some current uh, research directions I have in my lab on this topic. Specifically, I'm going to discuss uh, uh, relatively quickly about uh, representations of forecasting, traje forecasting trajectories that are more conducive to um, uh, um, uh, downstream robotics tasks and real-time control. Then I'm going to discuss uh, how to account for uncertainty sources that stem from upstream uh, perception modules. And finally, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about how to add logical structure to our predictions in order to condition, for example, on logical information such as uh, rules of the road. Let's start with the topic of uh, uh, representation for forecasted trajectories. Now, typically, all, most of the methods in uh, uh, trajectory forecasting uh, predict individual trajectories, that is, uh, tracklets, as, as their output. A tracklet is basically a sequence of waypoints. This is a very natural output structure uh, to provide. However, this representation is not the most conducive to control and decision making. As you saw from earlier in the talk, in order to do decision making, we have to sample a bunch of uh, uh, responses for the human, and this is, looks almost like an exhaustive search. So the question here, the research question here, here is, uh, can we devise more efficient representations for forecasted trajectories that are more conducive to planning and control? To address this question, we have recently proposed to represent intent prediction according to a system theoretic formalism. Specifically, the scene is modeled as a linear time barring system, where the state is a concatenated state of all of the agents, so the robotic vehicle and all the human agents, and the control is the control of the robot, again, U subscript of R. Explicitly, let's consider the case whereby we have uh, three agents. Agent number one is the uh, robotic vehicle, agent number two is a pedestrian, and agent number three is a human-operated uh, uh, vehicle. Um, what we want to do is to learn the green components of the system matrices, namely A, B, C, and D. Specifically, in the case of the state matrix A, you see that it is a, a three by three block matrix, three by three because we have three agents. The green elements represent the agent-to-agent -agent interactions that we want to learn from data. The blue blocks are basically the blocks that represent the dynamics of the agents that we assume we do know, for example. We can safely assume that uh, we do know the dynamics of uh, an autonomous car. We have one control, UR, that is the control of the robot. So here the point is that what we want to learn are the green components in the, um, uh, of the system matrices. And as a result, the conditional variational autoencoder model now produces uh, uh, as an output a mixture, mixture of uh, linear time varying uh, models, where each component linear time varying system corresponds to a different latent behavior. We have shown that with this more structured representation for the output of the conditional variation autoencoder model, we have a very slight decrease in terms of a prediction accuracy, but we have big gains in terms of a, a performance of the overall, overall closed loop system. Because now we can feed the decision-making control module with a representation, basically in terms of linear time varying uh, systems that is very well attuned to control, for example, through your model predict control uh, um, scheme of your choice. So this is an interesting example, I believe, of how a more structured representation of your output that is cognizant of the downstream control task leads to almost equivalent performance, but with the enormous gains in terms of computational efficiency. And this topic of finding representations that are more conducive to control is indeed becoming an increasingly, increasingly important component in my research. Specularly, we have been working on how to account for uh, uh, uncertainty that uh, stems from upstream perception models in two complementary ways. 
we are looking at, at how to propagate perceptual uncertainty through trajectory forecasting. For example, uh, in the image on the left, you can see that each object has an associated classification score. So the goal is to propagate this information throughout the trajectory forecasting task to account for these uncertainties stemming from the perception module. And complementarily, perception sometimes can be noisy. For example, here you can see that for some object, objects, we have uh, uh, high frequency class switches. So the research question is, how do we handle trajectory forecasting in a way that is uh, robust to these uh, uh, noise? And finally, we have also worked on how to add logical structure into our predictions. For example, to account for rules of the road and thereby increase the amount of information we can condition uh, our predictions over. Specifically, we have developed uh, a framework referred to as STLCG that expresses a signal temporal logic of formulas within the same computational graph paradigm used for deep learning. And we plan to exploit these results in a number of ways, in particular by jointly optimizing both prediction performance and robustness with respect to a desired um, signal temporal logic specification, uh, thereby embedding a logical structure into an otherwise uninterpretable model. And two, by verifying the logical properties of the model and detecting anomalies after uh, training. So I think it's a very interesting way of blending symbolic techniques with uh, uh, neural network techniques for the purposes of decision making. Takeaway message then is that the next generation trajectory forecasting methods in my view should account for downstream control applications through representation that are more conducive to decision making and control. It should also account for more structure, for example, logical structure. Now, before concluding, I would like to mention uh, a couple of uh, final thoughts. In particular, I want to briefly mention uh, uh, two additional research, uh, research directions in my group that entail a blending of machine learning and uh, optimal control techniques, which is the uh, key topic of this seminar series. The first one focuses on uh, embedding constraints in uh, model-based uh, uh, enforcement learning. Specifically, model-based enforcement learning, typically, typically what, one's, uh, what one does is to uh, record trajectory data in terms of state control next state or state derivative, and then set up a, a regression problem in order to compute uh, um, a model, and then use this model for the purposes of control. But critically, uh, in this procedure, there is nothing uh, in the algorithm that tells us that the model that we get is uh, particularly useful for the purposes of control. For example, allows us to generate trajectories that can be robustly tracked. So what we have investigated is how to add the constraints in the um, learning procedure in a way that we can actually derive models that are more conducive to control. For example, uh, here I'm showing a setting that we have recently explored in a paper published by Azure R uh, in 2020, how to add to um, the procedure a stabilizability constraint, basically a constraint that ensures that the model that we derive admits uh, a robust tracking controller for any open loop trajectory that is generated through this model. And specifically, we consider uh, contraction theory techniques in order to express these constraints through sufficient algebraic uh, properties. And I believe that uh, Professor Jean-Jacques Lutin mentioned this work as well during a talk he gave uh, in, the same, uh, sem in the same seminar series uh, uh, a few months ago. Another approach, uh, actually another research direction is represented by uh, what I refer to as meta-adaptive uh, control. Here the idea is to uh, merging ideas from meta-learning and adaptive uh, uh, control. Specifically in uh, adaptive control, uh, typically we have uh, um, parts of the dynamics that uh, we do not know but we assume they admit uh, uh, a futurized representation. For example, in this case, F will be the part of the dynamics that uh, are, uh, uh, is not known. And then we assume that uh, we have a bunch of futures uh, uh, phi that are known. And then we have a, a vector A or last layer, for example, neural network A, that we assume is unknown. An objective of the adaptive controller is to control the system 
to track some desired trajectory while adjusting the estimates of the weights A. So the key idea is this uh, research direction is to use data-driven methods to learn good features phi offline from past trajectory data. Specifically, the idea is to back propagate through simulated adaptive control loops to train features better suited uh, to the downstream task. In meta learning parlance, what we do is to uh, consider as an update online update rule in instead of some gradient steps, actually a full blown adaptive control law. And this is also aligned with some research, interesting research that uh, Sun Jo Chang at Caltech has uh, recently carried out. And we show that uh, uh, these methodologies allow us to um, be the controllers that uh, perform much better than in the case where the model uh, only consider uh, um, regression uh, regression methods. All right, so to conclude, um, key takeaway is that the uh, generative models are becoming a state-of-the-art tool for trajectory forecasting. We have recently published uh, a tutorial paper on this topic. And uh, if you don't want to go to the entire tutorial paper, you're welcome to read the blog post that uh, I have linked here. But these methods are quite difficult to integrate within an autonomy stack, primarily because of their output representation in terms of the tracklets. So I think the next steps in uh, this uh, field of research is uh, to reason about uh, representations for predictions that are more cognizant of downstream control applications, more tightly integrate uh, perception with trajectory prediction, and finally add some logical structure to models. With that, I would like to, oh, oh, all our code and data is available on our uh, GitHub website. And with that, I would like to conclude by thanking my many collabor collaborators, and in particular, uh, Karen Leon and Boris Ivanovic, they are the uh, two people on the top left who were the PhD students that uh, did most of the work that I presented today. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Marco, for the wonderful talk. Uh, perfect blend of control and learning. Uh, if there are any questions from the audience, please feel free to unmute yourselves or uh, post on the chat box. Um, I know there were some uh, questions from YouTube. Um, Guanya, if you would like to take. Yeah, uh, we have a question from Andrew from YouTube. Uh, hey, Marco, could you, uh, it's regarding the generalization in the trajectory prediction plus uh, reachability set approach. How does it generalize to a new vehicle? or a new driver? So uh, I haven't shown in the talk today, I mean, basically in the talk today, I focus primarily on uh, pairwise uh, interactions. But actually we do have uh, uh, also work that allow us to reason about uh, multiple agents. So the problem of uh, having multiple agents is basically solved in the context of project of plus plus, but basically adding a layer of uh, graph modeling. But what the, the question is pointing at, and I think it's a very interesting point, is that uh, when we train the model, we train the model from a human behavior, say, in a given city. But the um, way people drive and behave is uh, very local, meaning that it changes substantially from environment to environment. I typically like to make the example of how people drive in Italy. I'm from Italy. So in north of Italy, uh, when you drive and there is someone that is blinking and, at you, so it's using the blinking lights, it's a, a sign of kindness. It means uh, that person is giving you the right, is yielding to you so you can cut in front of that person. If you go to the south of Italy, it's exactly the opposite. If someone blinks at you, that is an aggressive sign. It means don't you dare to cut in front of me because I'm not gonna stop. And if you keep going, I'm going to crash into you. So you see how in the same country, the same bunch of Italians uh, behave in completely different ways. So the question is, if you learn your prediction model, your uh, intent prediction models by using data from the north of Italy, how does that generalize to the uh, south of Italy? That's a fantastic question. Right now, that's a key challenge, the challenge of uh, scalability. I think that some uh, uh, techniques in uh, 
meta learning and online adaptation could help here. But uh, I would say that uh, even though I didn't list it as one of the most promising research direction of this area, is one of the most promising research direction of this area. There is not a lot of work in trying to understand how to uh, take a model that has been trained, say, in Las Vegas, and then apply it in Rome, in Italy, uh, without having to retrain from scratch the entire model. How to do that through a few maybe online adaptations is very much an open question. And as I said, it's a little bit related to some of the work we've been doing on meta learning and online adaptation. But great question. There is also a question, I think, on the chat um, from Non Lee. They say, I would like to know when using an MPC controller, as mentioned in the first part of the talk. What is the criteria to decide the length of prediction horizon? Yeah, I mean, it's a... Uh, that uh, I don't think I have a very good uh, theoretical answer to that. It's as usual in uh, MPC, particularly for this complicated context, um, a compromise between uh, um, computational performance and... Uh, um, validity of your model, meaning that uh, the models I have discussed here are models really designed for decision making. So they give you uh, relatively good predictions for the next uh, two to three seconds. So that's more or less the time scale that uh, we look at. And that tends to be also re re um, an horizon that you can deal with from a computational standpoint. But the question here is really more uh, the answer here is to be more based on experience and uh, um, trials in the field as opposed to really standing from uh, first uh, uh, principles. I would also like to add though, that even though I haven't discussed it here, but in reality, uh, if you want to do longer planning, then probably you do not need to use such complicated uh, uh, intent prediction models, even for vehicles that are far away. So actually you can consider a, cas a, a cascading models, whereby for those that are relatively close to you, close in a dynamical sense, right, in terms of uh, uh, how long it takes in, in principle to crash with that vehicle. So for those, then you can use general models, but for those that are farther away, you can just use a very simple model, such as a forward dynamic pro 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 propagation and so on and so forth. Um, and this for, in this setting, then you can consider longer time horizon while still retaining computational tractability because you reason for those vehicles that are far away with a simple model. But in reality, uh, this is a great question. And uh, right now, our solution is mostly uh, based on experience. Great, thank you. Um, if there are any other quick uh, questions, yeah. maybe. Uh, actually, I have a question, Marco. I think the trade-off between uh, efficiency and safety is really interesting. Uh, and I, ha I have a question regarding uh, theoretical analysis. Actually, it's a question bothering, uh, have, uh, uh, is, I'm, 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 I've been thinking for a long time, like when, when we make theoretical analysis, usually we have to make some pessimistic assumption and deal with the worst case scenario. For example, in robust MPC, robust control. So how, how uh, do you want to comment on the some trade-offs between like theoretical analysis and like practical approach here regarding the trade-offs. Yeah. yeah, so as you said, when you want to be robust, especially, so the key idea here is that you want to reason adversarially when you are in a situation whereby your probabilistic predictions are out of the roof, are basically completely defined by how the environment around you is behaving. So the best thing that you can do is just to reason adversarially. But that introduces an element of the conservativism. So the entire point of this MPC approach was to try to put the uh, adversarial approach and the probabilistic approach on the same footing by blending them in the MPC optimization. And so basically, in order to make sure that the MPC optimization problem is always feasible so that uh, we don't run into a situation whereby we don't have a solution, we add uh, slack variables to each one of the constraints and then we penalize the slack variables in the, um, in the objective function. Now that said, 
I just want to make it clear that when we talk about safety guarantees, we really talk about uh, assurance guarantees. In my mind, there is, there is no theoretical proof that can tell you that uh, an autonomous system is going to be safe under all possible conditions. That is a bit of a misconception. What you want to do is to use these uh, theoretical guarantees and more principled methods in order to better inform the design. So for example, even in classical control, when uh, you consider phase and gain margins in order to come up with a good design for your controller, that shouldn't be considered as an absolute proof of safety. Obviously, if your airplane is flying in a steady uh, level flight and an asteroid uh, hits the airplane, you can have as much phase margin as you want, but the airplane is going to crash. It's really, it should really be interpreted as a, reinterpreted as a tool to inform better design and provide assurances that uh, your system is going to work uh, typically well. So a long answer to say a couple of things. Planning, adversarial and probabilistic planning is uh, tricky. And uh, in order to do it well, you really, really have to go down to the specific of a problem setting. That's why in this talk, I decided to focus on uh, interaction over decision-making as a setting you could do it in a different way. And two, I claim that uh, theoretical methods, based, a particular control theoretical method should be considered more as a tool to better inform design, as opposed to something that we want to harness to have globally safety properties that in my mind are unattainable. Thanks, I, I totally agree. Hi, I have a question. Uh, uh, you, uh, you said we use a linear model to, uh, to model the uh, car, but uh, as far as I know, the, uh, the car is a non-holonomic mechanical system and its linearization is uh, not uh, controllable. Uh, I will, if you... Yeah, so, yeah, so we, we use um, um, a linearized, so as you said, we use a linearized model of a single track uh, uh, model for a car which is fairly standard in, uh, in, in this field. And then uh, remember that uh, we use this model for trajectory tracking purposes in a receiving horizon setting. So basically we just do a control and then uh, we reobserve the environment and then we reoptimize our decisions. So in this regard, this is fairly standard. As I said, this MPC optimization problem is quite standard. I would claim that also a lot of companies are using this MPC control scheme the innovation here is to um, the innovation here is to add uh, these uh, uh, instantaneous interaction safety constraints. But everything else is standard as we understood in the literature. Thank you. Sure. Okay, we are a bit over time. Um, if there is a quick question, maybe we can take that. Otherwise. Well, and if you have more questions, feel free to email me and I'll be happy to reply to yes. your questions. Okay, um, so let's um, thank Marco again. Thank you so much, Marco, uh, for the wonderful talk. Thank you very much, and, my pleasure. And as I said, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy to uh, continue the interesting discussion we had uh, offline. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Um, next week, we will have Dr. Anka Dragon from UC Berkeley. Um, hope you can join us again. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.